And uh, I will call the October 12th, 2021 Lake Mills Public Works Board meeting to order. Um, Misty, can you take the roll call, please? Mr. Picard? Here. Mr. Temperley? Here. Mr. Fields? Here. Mr. Palachek? Mr. Palachek? Mr. Wright? Here. Can you hear me? Mr. Rupplinger? A real delay. Mr. Rupplinger? I have everybody marked in except for Mr. Palachek and Mr. Rupplinger. Okay. Up next is the correction and approval of the minutes of September 14, 2021. I'll entertain a motion to approve the minutes. This is John, so move. This is Mark, second. I guess we can just do this in a voice. So all in favor say aye. 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 All right, the minutes are approved. Uh, questions and public comment. I don't see any guests in the chat. Is there anybody there, Steve? No. All right. Strange council member, but that's it. All right. Then we'll move on to uh, the director's report. Okay. Thank you. That delay is going to drive me nuts. But okay. First of all, let me wish everybody a happy Public Power Week. This is. Uh, the uh, National Public Power Week, when we celebrate all the folks that uh, are our customers and uh, support our utility. And I just remind everybody that we have a little uh, project going where we're doing a um, collecting food and such for the food pantry. And in return for that, you get a chance to win one of many prizes that we have. Uh, and you should have gotten a flyer, seen a flyer on that. So again, thanks to everybody for being part of our public power utility. All right, couple things then real quick. The uh, 2021 lead service line replacement program, just a quick update there. Uh, we had talked about in the past that we probably aren't gonna hit the 75 that we had uh, uh, asked for grant money for, but we might come up pretty close to 60. We know that a couple of the contractors are uh, making a last ditch, ditch effort to get more in, so we'll take that. That's good. The AMI update hasn't changed much in the last month. We're still waiting for uh, chips to be put into our water meters, so we don't have any of those to install, and the guys are kind of catch as catch can installing some electric meters. Our hope is that again, once, once we get past the first of the year and start getting more water meters in, we can start working at it a, a little bit quicker. The next one is the water system corrosion control project. And we are at the one year mark since we did the test rack. If you recall at well six, we had to do a, a corrosion control experiment and we got the results from that. And so now we are at the point where we're beginning to uh, implement that. And the project or the part of the project that we're working on right now is setting the base for the amount of chemical that is making its way through the system. And just so you understand what we're talking about are uh, chemicals that we put into the water in, in you know, very small amounts designed to kind of put a coating on the pipes so that uh, nothing can leach into the water. Uh, we control the corrosion. I guess that's why it's called a corrosion control project, but uh, it's to make the system a little bit safer. And the DNR instructed us to do the, the test and then worked with us to establish what the uh, new corrosion control chemical limit is going to be. And so to make sure this is working, we go out now and do tests at three different sites and we'll continue to do those tests through the year. And then next year about this time is when we will actually change our chemical makeup for corrosion control and then we'll continue to run these uh, sampling tests to make sure that what we anticipate is supposed to happen is actually happening. 
And the only other note I'm going to make on this one is that these test samples, again, we take them at three different places, are really quite invasive. What happens is we have to go into uh, the resident's house. We take 18 water samples, uh, and we do this every month. And so we have, we're fortunate to have found three places where the people are willing to help us work with us on this. And so uh, a big thank you to those folks because this will be two years at least of us going into their house on a regular basis and it has to be right away in the morning. Uh, so it is, it's kind of an invasive test, but uh, again, we're very pleased that they're helping us out and uh, hopefully this will make a difference in uh, how we protect the pipes and how we protect our, our water users. And I'm just, I'm gonna note here, I know we talked about this a little bit last year. This is something that we're doing that many other cities are not and likely will not. Uh, we are a little bit of a test case, if you will, for a lot of other communities. And so they may get off without having to do this. We have gotten inquiries from three other communities. I think it's Green Bay, Waukesha, and Watertown, uh, wondering if they can buy our test rack. And uh, so we're, uh, we're kind of looking at maybe going to the highest bidder. I'm semi-kidding here, but we need to recoup a lot of money from that, that test rack. And uh, again, it's not, it's not something that every city is gonna have to have to do. The next thing then, you asked me to kind of keep you informed about the PEEPER contract. That's the, the unit price contract that we have with PEEPER to install underground electric uh, facilities. We did have them install the electric line in the new Brookstone addition. And they did that while we finished installing electric lines in the uh, Tyranina or the Mud Lake Road um, addition. And just by comparison, their contract or their cost, estimated cost, we haven't gotten the final bills for that yet, was uh, about $11,700. We just kind of roughly figured what that would have cost us to do, and we were about $1,000 cheaper, about $10,700. Uh, but again, we were able to do two projects in one, so we believe that the, the cost benefit is there. And the last thing, and I know, Duane, I didn't talk to you about this, but do you want to do a street construction project update? Sure. Uh, thanks, Paul. Um, if uh, been around the city today, there was some activity with some paving. Uh, final paving on Tyranita Point uh, occurred this morning, as well as some milling and base patching on Mulberry Street uh, occurred uh, this morning. In between the raindrops and other um, uh, scheduling issues, uh, we hope that they will be back tomorrow and Thursday uh, to complete uh, patches throughout the city and then the final mill and overlay on Veterans Lane, Mulberry, and East Lake Street. Um, that should uh, bring us uh, close to completion on patching for the year. Um, included in that would be all of the water main LSL replacement uh, patches um, and most of the maintenance program, uh, we hope to be uh, basically complete by the end of this week if the weather holds. Thank you. Any questions on any of that? We went through that rather quickly. This is Todd. There's something going on in my street, Fremont. What, what's that? Uh, Todd, uh, Todd, there are, there are two, two LSL, LSL replacements, replacements that occurred on that street. street. Uh, uh, the patches, patches will occur uh, hopefully, hopefully tomorrow, tomorrow. Uh, but, but there, there is, is rain, rain forecast, forecast, so it could, could be, be Thursday. Thursday. Oh, okay. I, I, thought every, I thought everyone in the block had got this done, so okay, thanks. Sure. sure. All right. Any other questions from the other board members? Uh, Missy, I think Bennett's on. Is that correct, Bennett? Yes, he is. I put him in minutes at approximately 5.04 p.m. Okay, thanks. All right. If there's no other questions for the director's report, we'll move on to item six, discussion and recommendation on wastewater treatment plant facilities report. 
All right, thank you. If, if I may, Don, I'm just gonna go back one half step. Uh, you, you reminded me, there are other things going in town. There's a company that's putting a fiber optic line through town. And so we've been, been getting a lot of questions on uh, why, is, why there's digging in the street and in the right of way and, and that sort of thing. So that's most likely what it is, a, a large fiber optic line going through Lake Mills. So I'm sorry, I just wanted to backtrack real quick there. Okay. So uh, then on to the, uh, the wastewater treatment plant facilities plan. I've got just a couple of comments and then we'll turn it over to our friends from Strand and go through the presentation. And I want to, at this point, just welcome. I see there's a couple of city council members here. Three, actually, I'm sorry. We, we invited them to sit in on this discussion just to, to get a good handle on what's going on here. This is a big discussion. There's some big decisions that are coming up. And so the more information that we can get to people, the more times that we can get people hearing the same thing at the same time, I think so much the better in making a good, informed, uh, long-term uh, decision. So thank you for joining us this evening. I want to point out that what you're going to hear tonight really amounts to about five options. There's three options and then option number three has got a couple of extra options to it. And to let you know that really doing nothing at this point is not an option, that we've got some issues we've got to address. Mostly regulatory uh, has to do with our, our effluent and, and we'll talk more about that. But uh, please keep in mind as you're weighing the decision that status quo uh, just isn't going to make it. We are, or we've talked with Strand about putting together a plan for the next 20 to 40 years, which is a long time. Uh, you know, I certainly won't be here when it's all said and done. Uh, maybe quicker if things go really bad. but. Um, and so I want you to understand that the design options are based on that 20 to 40 year uh, design cycle. And the best information we can use, as you can see, is going to be our history and a, a range of assumptions. And again, you'll see that in the presentation. And that we are looking at both short and long-term costs here. The whole purpose of the facilities report and the reason it was initiated in the first place really is that we know that the DNR is going to change the regulations and the limits on our effluents, partic effluent, particularly in the area of phosphorus. And so to meet those, uh, a lot of things have to happen. And that really is what, what started this whole thing. Uh, the other things, the other reasons behind this is that we, we need to ensure that we've got a dependable, compliant system, that we do address uh, new treatment requirements, uh, that we look at new treatment options, and, you know, look at the new technologies, and we've got an aging plant. Our, our existing plant really is, from an age standpoint, almost at the end of it. From a capacity standpoint, doing okay, but it is aging out, and so we, we need to really take a good hard look at this. I'll also mention that we need to move forward steadily. Now, we are planning for something to be up and running, if you will, in 2025. So we've got a few years you know, that we're working with here, but certainly to uh, put the design together, to do you know any kind of planning, uh, estimating of costs, et cetera, et cetera, we need some time to do it. And so I'm gonna try to encourage a sense of urgency here that we do keep moving steadily forward, that we do keep working on this. Uh, even though we're looking at three years, if you will, that's gonna go pretty fast and we've got a lot to do in that time. Well, can I and along you for a second? Yeah, absolutely, go ahead. Uh, you, you said the DNR is uh, is going to, uh, and I forget exactly what your word was, but <clears throat> Lake Mills is going to be subject to new effluent uh, requirements. Yes. Is that something just being put on Lake Mills, or is that statewide? Well, it's it's probably actually nationwide, to tell you the truth, especially with the phosphorus. But it's definitely uh, one that Lake Mills has to pay attention to. Uh, so the, are there, the, are there be go ahead, I'm sorry. 
are there going to be a lot of communities in Wisconsin that are going to be doing the same thing we're doing here? Yeah, I'm, I'm looking at our, our engineers and they're nodding their head and I would say everyone is ultimately going to have to do something here, right? You okay, can. thank you. And, and John, I'll tell you too, we'll get in, they'll get into that a little bit more because again, there are a variety of options to accomplish what we need to accomplish. So we're going to try to cover all those bases. Okay, thank you. You bet, you bet. And the last thing I just I want to say, and just kind of to ask you to keep this in mind as we go through these discussions and we talk about uh, costs and design and all that sort of thing is, it, it, it's kind of a three-legged stool or uh, what I learned long time ago when I worked for the co-ops, uh, when you're in a service organization or you're running a service, there's really three things that have to be done together. Uh, some people refer to it as people, planet, and profit. In other words, those three things we have to pay attention to. Can't You can rearrange the order, but you can't do the other two without one. Sometimes it's referred to as social, environmental, and financial, or uh, service, safety, and sustainability. But as we go through this, please understand that we are certainly going to be looking at how to, what an impact this is going to have on rates. But we also have to make sure that we keep providing the service that is uh, safe and adequate and that we adhere to all the environmental issues. And this is true for wastewater, but it's also true for water and electric, this, this three-legged stool. So I just ask you as we're going through this to keep that in mind that we've got some heavy responsibilities there. So, I see Travis has been up and down a few times waiting for me to shut up, so I will now do that. And I'll, I'll turn this over to uh, the engineers from Strand to go through the presentation. Thank you guys very much for being here. Great. Can you still hear me okay? I can hear you, and you can see the presentation. Excellent. So thanks for having us here tonight. I'm Jane Carlson from Strand Associates. I gave the presentation last time when we were here in July with Scott Stearns, who's also here tonight. And we did the deep dive into the wastewater treatment plant, so to speak. And uh, so this time, after, after this group asked us to look into these different options and a few different scenarios for you going out 20 and 40 years, Travis Anderson from our office got involved in the project. He's done a lot of these evaluations in the recent past. And so he put together the costs and a technical memo that I think you received in your packets. And Travis has been with Strand Associates about 11 years now. He has a master's degree and a bachelor's degree in environmental engineering. And um, just one thing more before I turn it over to him, there was a question earlier about whether this is a statewide mandate, the phosphorus requirements, and it is a statewide regulation. It is um, affecting treatment plants that discharge to smaller streams more than say a treatment plant that discharged to a big river like the Mississippi River or the Wisconsin River. In some cases, they don't have quite as stringent limits, but. Lake Mills has a small receiving stream and so very stringent limits. So with that, I'd like to turn it over to Travis to go through the presentation. Okay, thanks Jane. And uh, thanks for having us tonight to talk about this with everyone. So I'll be going through some slides on the different treatment plant options that were evaluated that were in the tech memo that Jane mentioned. And certainly feel free to jump in here uh, for any uh, discussion if you have questions as we as we go through this feel feel free to dive in at any point so an overview of the highlights of what uh, I'll be going through here uh, first touch on the background and some of the recent activities that uh, strand in the city have been working on since the last meeting when Jane and Scott were here uh, we'll talk about the population projections that were developed for, for those 20-year uh, and 40-year time frames and then the resulting flows and loads for those projections. I'll review those three options that Paul, were, Paul was talking about for uh, the treatment plant location, uh, the benefits and drawbacks, and then the costs associated with those options. And then we'll wrap up with our schedule and next steps and, and any further discussion. 
So starting with the schedule and uh, kind of the recent activities that uh, we've been working on the past couple months uh, since that July meeting, uh, the city and Strand had a meeting with the DNR to discuss the multi-discharger variants for phosphorus compliance uh, back in August. And they requested some additional information that uh, we provided to DNR. And DNR has followed up with uh, a request for further information that uh, we will be working on. And we'll actually tie in a lot of the data that was included in the tech memo into that response back to DNR. That brings us to uh, today's meeting. And from this point, uh, once, a, you know, for, once a decision is made as far as what option the city would like to move forward with, then uh, we can progress with finalizing the facilities plan uh, for early 2022. Uh, some of the near-term upcoming items, there is a, a brief phosphorus uh, progress report that's due to DNR to give them an update on where things stand. And that additional information that I mentioned for the multi-discharger variants is due to DNR on November 9th ultimately leading to uh, the compliance date that Paul mentioned of 2025 for compliance with the phosphorus limits. So the objectives for reviewing the, these uh, options, some of these uh, objectives were discussed at the last meeting, but it's really to confirm the long-term strategy for the treatment plant. And to do that, uh, we needed to look at a longer time frame than, than just 20 years because of the significant costs involved and, and the uh, life remaining at the existing plant. And we needed to account for the age uh, and the site constraints at the existing plant site. So we've got an aerial photo shown here with the, the blue uh, uh, dash line outlining the, the footprint of the existing treatment plant. And as you can see, there's not a, a lot of green space there available for expansion. So that needed to be taken into account. And ultimately we're evaluating the various benefits, costs, and uh, determining that potential time frame for uh, if and when it makes sense to move the, the treatment plant to a new uh, different location. And this table shows the population projections that were developed in the tech memo. Uh, we're looking at two different sets of projections. One is provided by the Department of Administration. So those are the formal uh, population projections provided for each municipality in the state. And that put uh, the city at uh, roughly 1% annual population increase. And, and that's comparable with the, the, the growth that the city has seen in the recent past. We also wanted to look at a more aggressive population growth and to do that, we, we looked at communities that are of similar size in the state uh, and, and look at the, the highest growing communities that matched roughly the population. And uh, those communities were largely the suburbs surrounding Madison. So communities like DeForest, uh, Fitchburg, Middleton, Wanakee, those types of communities are all growing at, at an average rate of about two and a half percent per year. And just to clarify that, uh, what we did is we, we took, uh, it was really a 50% growth over 20 years and, and we backed that into an average rate of, of two and a half percent annually. And that results in the population growth that you see in the table here, uh, comparing that DOA projection to the high growth projection. And, and there are no projections that go out 40 years available. The, the projection for DOA only goes out to 2040. So all we did there was extrapolate that out another 20 years. We, we asked DOA and, and, and they, don't, they, they just don't go out that far. And taking those population projections, we recalculated the flow and loadings uh, for both options and then we looked at 2042 and 2062 because we developed costs for all those options. And we're not gonna go through all these numbers here, but uh, I, I highlighted a couple of the key items, which are the peak hourly flow to the plant. A lot of components in the plant are designed around that peak hourly flow. And you can see that we're evaluating a, a wide range of flows here uh, from, from 5.3 MGD 
uh, in the DOA 2042 uh, alternative up to that 9.8 for the high growth. So uh, again, evaluating a wide range of, of flows and loading similar to the, the BOD uh, loading uh, from 2000 up to about 3,800 pounds per day. So we really wanted to bracket uh, a large increase in potential loadings over that 40 years. Yes. yes. I'm just going to ask uh, the, the committee, do any of you need those abbreviations explained, the BOD and the TSS and the TKN? Do you all understand what that is, or are you comfortable with what we're talking about here? I need a refresh in TSS and TKN. BOD, that's the, um, I guess, concentration of the material. Is that correct? Yes. Yeah, so, so BOD is the biological oxygen demand. Yeah. Uh, and TSS is the total suspended solids. So th those those two are are related. Uh, the the TKN is is the total Keldahl nitrogen. Uh, so that that's the nitrogen that's coming into the plant. And then TP is the total phosphorus. So if, again, phosphorus is driving a, a lot of these um, decisions. So that's an important one as well. Okay. Good question. Then to, to provide a refresher on the limits request, because uh, this was, is, is an important driver in the discussion, uh, Strand requested that DNR calculate the limits for the plant as a part of this facility plan, and, and that was in order to confirm that the current limits that you had were going to remain in, in effect. And they came back with limits that were much lower than the current limits. And uh, we followed up with DNR and, and determined that uh, there were some issues with some assumptions that they were making regarding the stream classification and flows. Uh, so we requested recalculation of those limits for the Rock Creek and as well as new limits for the Crawfish River so that we could evaluate the potential for moving the discharge location. And that correspondence resulted with uh, anticipated limits that are uh, shown in the table here. And uh, to break this down in its simplest form, the most strict limits are for Rock Creek or that, that option one uh, in the left-hand column. And as you go to the right, uh, the, the least strict limits are in that option three for a new treatment plant on the Crawfish River. And some of the key uh, differences here, I have highlighted the BOD, uh, the, Le uh, less restrictive for the new plant option on the Crawfish River. But uh, the, the big driver here is the total phosphorus limit. So you can see that the plant has a current limit of one milligram per liter. And under that option one Rock Creek, it goes down to 0 0.075 milligrams per liter, uh, which is a, a very stringent limit that uh, requires really high quality filtration in order to, to, meet, that, uh, to meet that level. Because of those differences and the site constraints that we were talking about earlier, the three options were evaluated. So those are staying at the existing treatment plant site and continuing discharge to Rock Creek. Option two is staying at the current site, but changing the outfall location and pumping to the Crawfish River. And then option three is construction of a brand new plant that would discharge to the Crawfish River. And we wanted to evaluate a range of technologies for option three. And there are certainly other technologies available besides what we have listed here. But, uh, but we covered the range here from tried and true to an innovative new technology. So that would be the oxidation ditch, a conventional activated sludge plant, and a newer technology called aerobic granular sludge. So I'll just briefly go walk through these different options in the next few slides. So option one is staying at the existing plant, continuing discharge to Rock Creek. And just due to the age of the equipment at the plant, a lot of the equipment is approximately 30 years old. And those increases in flows and loadings uh, that we were discussing earlier, uh, most of the processes at the plant need to be improved in some manner. And I, in the text boxes here, I've highlighted the, the major improvements that are necessary. So that would be a replacement of the influent pumps and screens to accommodate those new uh, peak hourly flows. 
uh, a new oxidation ditch to, to handle increased loading that could likely be phased in uh, in the next five to ten years. A new final clarifier, again, that's peak flow based. Uh, new sludge storage tank, UV disinfection, and then cloth disc filters, both to accommodate the more stringent uh, TS, uh, total suspended solids limit and the, the stricter phosphorus limit that we've been discussing. Option two is very similar to option one. It would still require all those upgrades that I just mentioned, uh, but uh, in this option, you would have a less stringent phosphorus effluent limit. Uh, the downside is you would have to pump over to uh, the Crawfish River. And we wanted to point out that this is very possibly a long-term compliance strategy for the city if you stay at the existing treatment plant site because if the Rock Creek gets reclassified you'll end up with much stricter limits that's going to require very costly treatment. So even if it's not done now uh, this, this should be kept in mind as a possible compliance strategy down the road. And then option three is the new treatment plant site 3A as a new oxidation ditch so this is very similar in operation to the existing treatment plant. Uh, what would be added would be biological nutrient removal. So that would be both phosphorus and nitrogen being removed biologically. And we included nitrogen here just because that's more energy efficient and there's possibly total nitrogen limits coming down the road in future regulations. And then different from the current plant site, uh, we've included biosolids dewatering to provide further flexibility for biosolids management. Option 3B is a new activated sludge treatment plant. So that's similar to an oxidation ditch, but it has a smaller uh, activated sludge treatment system with uh, aerobic digestion. So that's really the only difference here. It would still be designed for biological nutrient removal, and we'd still plan for biosolids dewatering. And then option 3C is the, is the newer technology, the more innovative technology called aerobic granular sludge. And that's a, a pretty new treatment process in the United States. There's a lot of installations in Europe, but there's only a couple of wastewater treatment plants that have uh, implemented this so far with a few more that are under construction this year. And what this process does is it promotes the, the formation of granules that have different uh, that have different zones uh, for biological nutrient removal. So they have an outer aerobic zone, uh, a kind of a middle anoxic zone, and then an anaerobic zone in the middle. So with those three different zones, you are able to remove both phosphorus and nitrogen rather than constructing the series of tanks and selecting for the organisms that requires a larger footprint. So this process is able to use a, a smaller footprint and be uh, relatively energy efficient and it and it uses uh, it's, it's similar to a sequencing back batch reactor where you have a fill and draw cycle a reaction phase and then a settling phase where you're selecting for the formation of these granules and this just shows the schematic for that uh, for that aerobic granular sludge system uh, it uh, it is a more modular system. So it has the benefit of being simpler to expand as flows and loads increase because rather to having to add air, new aeration tanks, clarifiers, pumping, uh, you are basically just adding one more reactor into the system. And then in any of these designs, we just wanted to point out that uh, we'd be incorporating Sustainable solutions, uh, these, are, these are fairly common on uh, our wastewater treatment plant projects, recovering uh, heat for HVAC systems, possibly implementing solar, uh, using high efficiency equipment, VFDs with controls for energy efficiency and uh, high efficiency lighting. Uh, basically all of those would be incorporated regardless of what alternative gets selected. And the next couple slides before we get into the costs go over the benefits and the drawbacks of the different options. And um, I know that 
a lot of these were discussed at the last meeting, but uh, I, I think they're, they're important to reiterate. So the, the main benefit of, of staying at the existing site is that you have such a large investment already in that infrastructure that's there, and that that would require the least amount of pumping uh, because you're not having to pump to another site. And it's also, of course, familiar to, to the current operations staff. And the option two of pumping to the Crawfish River it has similar benefits, but uh, it, it, the key benefit of going to that option is the less uh, stringent phosphorus limit. So basically the plant would be able to keep its current limit of one. And the new site has a lot of benefits, uh, some of which are, are apparent when you look at costs and, and some are really non-monetary. So you'd have the least stringent effluent limits and, and then, as I mentioned, it's, a lot of these are, it's, it's hard to put a monetary value on. So you'd be better able to address future growth, uh, which, which I think is a key part of this discussion. It's gonna provide a buffer between the treatment plant and, and residences. So it's gonna move the plant out of the city away from residential areas. Uh, we haven't gotten into uh, the biosolids component yet, but it's likely that at some point in the future, uh, there's gonna, the existing plant is going to run out of space for biosolids management. So you'd be able to plan ahead and have all treatment facilities on one site. You'll be able to more easily serve that growth that uh, could potentially happen north of the interstate. Uh, it could potentially improve Rock Creek and uh, like I was talking about with the aerobic granular sludge, you'd have uh, a clean slate for implementing new technologies that might get developed. And of course, you could plan for space for future expansion much more easily than at the current site. And then as, as far as drawbacks go for the existing site, I just mentioned that you'd probably want to start planning for land acquisition for biosolids management and then eventually uh, land for a future treatment plant site. You're going to have that very stringent phosphorus limit. Uh, which for which M the MDV eligibility is, is currently questionable. The current site's on an old landfill, which increases uh, difficulty during construction, and it's going to be significantly more difficult to expand on the current site in the future. Option two has similar drawbacks to option one, but you have the additional drawback of having to pump uh, several miles over to Crawfish River. And then the drawbacks of the new site are primarily cost-based. It, it's a higher cost option, uh, which isn't surprising because you're having to start from scratch with, with new infrastructure, but the costs become cl much closer the longer out you look and the higher growth is in, in the meantime. Uh, another downside is you have to uh, go through the land acquisition process taken into account uh, setback requirements and you're still going to have to pump from the current site uh, over to the new treatment plant site. So now we're going to get into cost. The, the next few slides here go over uh, the, the various capital costs and total present worth costs that were developed. So this first slide here compares uh, the, the five different options both looking at the DOA projection and that high projection. So the high projection are the, are the hashed bars. And uh, you can see that option one is the lowest uh, cost option uh, on a capital cost basis. And uh, you, you, what you can also learn from this graph is that the three options that were considered for option three are all pretty comparable. I would say at a at a planning level, all of these costs are, are pretty much equal. And then you have option two, uh, basically right in the middle uh, of, the, of, of option one and option three. And then this graphic shows the, it's basically the same, the same graph, but uh, it's looking at total present worth. So it's taking into account the capital costs plus the costs of operation, such as maintenance and energy. And, and again, you see a, a similar pattern here where, where option one is, is, the, uh, is the lowest cost option. Uh, and we did take into account in option one, uh, the construction of pumping and a force main to pump uh, the flow over to 
of the Crawfish River during that second 20 year phase. So we wanted to accommodate for that um, because like we, we talked about, that's, that's probably uh, a, a good long-term compliance strategy. And then he, I'm sorry, the previous graphic was for the DOA projection. This, this graphic is total present worth for the, the uh, high projection. And in, in this graphic, the, the 40 year present worth are, are starting to converge. You can see that the, the costs on a 40 year basis are, are getting a lot closer. There's not, there's not as much difference between the various options uh, when, when you're looking out this far. And then finally, we wanted to look at the relative rate impacts and, and consider that. So uh, I, I think what's, what's key to take away from this graphic is really the, the relative difference between the various options, because this, this graphic oversimplifies the, the rate increases because it doesn't take into account the potential for phased construction, uh, which is available for options one and two. So if the if, if it's selected that the, the treatment plant site will remain where it is now, you could phase a lot of these improvements in, uh, maybe do some now and some in 10 years, whereas for option three, you'd have to build it all at once. So this, uh, this rate increase doesn't take into account phasing. It also doesn't incorporate things like debt retirement or additional users being added in for population growth. So that's why I say that it, it's, it's probably best uh, served to, to use to look at the, diff the, the differential between the various options. So when we look at comparing option one to option three, that differential in the, the rate impact is about $300 per year. And this is all assuming a 20 year loan, a clean water fund loan at the, the current low interest rates that are available. So in conclusion, as Paul mentioned, because of the age of a lot of the equipment and the, the new regulations that are coming and the compliance schedule, uh, we, we weren't able to evaluate a do nothing option. Uh, we did determine that under those DOA projections, the, the treatment plant has adequate space with the exception of uh, potentially uh, needing to move biosolids management offsite uh, in the future. So that would involve uh, trucking to a uh, to newly purchased land at a at a different location that would uh, likely be beyond 20 years because this first phase is going to include additional liquid sludge storage the existing treatment plant site will not have adequate uh, space past 40 years under that high growth scenario basically in that two and a half percent annual growth uh, scenario uh, even with all the additional tanks that could be constructed on the site, you're out of space at that point. So you'd have to either get additional land adjacent to the plant or, or move to a different site at that point if growth continued at that rate. Uh, so the city should consider investing in land for uh, either biosolids management or in addition to that, potentially a, a future wastewater treatment plant site. Uh, Growth should, of course, be monitored so that this evaluation can can happen uh, during future phases as well, especially if growth increases beyond those DOA projections. And uh, just wanted to point out that, of course, technology is going to change over 20 to 40 years. You know, we've, we've, of course, seen that in the past 20 to 40 years, and there's no reason to expect that that would be, be different now. So there may be different technologies available in the future. And the lowest total present worth option in this evaluation was option one, uh, staying at the, the existing treatment plant. But uh, as we mentioned, that there, there are a lot of non-monetary uh, pros and cons that require important consideration as well. So with that, the last slide I have here before we maybe get into discussion is just uh, is just the same schedule that uh, we presented earlier with uh, the game plan moving forward of, of finalizing the facility plan to ultimately hit that compliance date of 2025. So I know that was a, a lot of uh, information that we went through, but uh, 
you know, I'm hoping now that we can have a, a discussion and go through any questions you might have. Travis, this is Mark. Um, could you talk a little bit about the, the MDV, what that would, how that would impact and the likelihood of that happening? Yeah, so, so the MDV would allow for uh, a, a, an additional time frame of three permit terms uh, where you would pay $50 a pound that's discharged down to a, a target of 0.2 milligrams per liter. So it could delay the, uh, the requirement for hitting that low limit of 0 0.075 uh, for a few permit terms. A at the end of, of the MDV period, then you would have to achieve compliance with that final limit. So you'd be looking at either uh, tertiary treatment, uh, you know, filtration of some point at, uh, of some kind, or something like water quality trading or adaptive management. And, and as far as the likelihood of that happening, we're, we're working with, uh, with DNR right now to to determine that eligibility, um, they, they requested additional information on the costs, which we'll, we'll use the, the work that was done in this tech memo to, to, uh, to answer their questions regarding the costs. So we, we, should know, we should know more, uh, hopefully by the end of the year here after we get all that information back to DNR and, and they are able to review it and make a final determination. I don't know if you have more to add on that, Jane, from your meetings with DNR. It, 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 is, a, is a permit term a year or, or, or longer than a year? A permit term is five years. So basically, at the, the, if the MDB gets renewed, there is a renewal that's coming up in 2027 where the state will have to renew uh, the legislation that allows for the MDB. If that gets renewed, you would have three permit terms, and after that point, you'd have to start down uh, the path of you know, whatever is selected for final compliance, whether that's a watershed option or a, a plant upgrade. Okay, I'll just go around. Each, each board member gets a turn, so I'll go alphabetically. And do you have any questions or concerns? Yeah, I do have a question, and I think that this is probably more uh, more so directed probably at at, at Paul and his staff. So um, it seems like whatever option um, we go with in the future, there's going to be a need for land acquisition. Um, do we have any prospects for potential parcels of land that would be suitable um, for either the, the the waste storage or maybe even the water new water treatment plant, if that's the way we go? I'm, I'm going to answer that by saying, yes, we've talked about that and we've identified some areas, but I'm not going to tell you what they are because the land value goes way up once we do that. But yeah, we've absolutely okay. looked at that. So how would that process work then? Because it would have to get become public at some point, correct? And does that still happen, the, the increase in land value? Yeah. Uh, I can, as a former council member and Greg Walters is on, yeah, I mean, you just can't publicly discuss bargaining. And then mm -hmm. it becomes public at, when the council decides to make an offer or accept an offer. Okay. Probably in Probably this, in this case, case, we're going to have to go through um, a condemnation process, uh, which is very heavily regulated by the federal and state governments. And uh, you have to go into a negotiation that provides um, appraisals from the city and the landowner, and then uh, some negotiation in between there to come up with some point in between those two. And then there's a little bit added on. So, um, <clears throat> and that's generally done by a specialized consultant that the city uses. Um, so, um, I would anticipate that that uh, if you're going to uh, acquire this property, it's probably going to be by condemnation. 
but whoever owns the property has a say, right? I mean, we're talking property outside the city. Yeah, that doesn't matter. Um, we can we can condemn outside the city. the The issue is going to be, you know, what the what the needs are of the city and why, um, because probably the locations that that uh, you're you're going to have to go to um, probably have historical family issues and you're going to have to you're not going to be able to to work through those problems and shift up or down a lot so it's probably the likelihood is is that you're going to go through a condemnation process that'd be the first time for this city right no we've done uh, condemnations about four out of the last seven years oh which, which, which can you say which properties we did a bunch on elm street and um birch street and we did some on south main and um, mulberry was it just the easements or i mean i don't the whole property or uh some of it was whole property some oh. of it was easements okay Any more questions, Bennett? Yeah, pre, um, one more. Um, so, you know, there was a mention about uh, within costs, there was a grant option. Um, do any of these options out there lend themselves more favorably to obtaining a grant or does, does that really matter at all? I mean, there, there's potential principal forgiveness under the Clean Water Fund loan for phosphorus projects. Uh, I don't know that um, it would really matter which option is selected because that's capped at uh, $1 million. And, and any of these would be you know, far in excess of that. So uh, you know, that, that's the main one um, as far as grants go. So yeah, so I guess to answer your question, I, I don't I don't think that the option would really have an impact on the grant that's available. I'm pretty sure that the options won't have an impact on it, but the uh, low to mods will for us, and we've never qualified for that, and we've always had to pay ours back. I appreciate the insights. One last question is probably a question out of ignorance, but um, these projects with wastewater treatment plants have to be solely funded through rate. There are no other um, revenue funding options outside of, of rate for residential and commercial and industrial customers. I guess that's what we've been assuming that this would, uh, that this would all be funded from utility revenue. <clears throat> there aren't a lot of options to the city of Lake Mills. There, um, some wastewater treatment plants are partially funded through ta property taxes, but um, since we've never done it, there's no uh, room under the levy cap, so it's essentially a non-starter. You would have to go 100% rates. I appreciate the clarification. That, that's uh, that's all the questions I had. Um, John, you're next. Any questions or concerns? Uh, no, I can't think of any right now. Okay. Um, I see Greg Waters is on. He must have some questions because ultimately he's going to have to decide on this. Any questions, Greg, or are you going to wait to come to council? I think I'm going to wait and absorb some of this and, and maybe ask some questions of staff uh, even before the council meeting to, to get my bearings on it. But uh, there's a lot, a lot here and a lot to absorb. But, yeah, uh, it is. I mean, normally an ordinance goes through three readings at the council level before they vote. So we're just really starting to get into this. So I really don't see us making a clean cut recommendation tonight. So it's great information, and uh, thanks for inviting me to the to the meeting. Appreciate it. 
All right, uh, Mr. Fields, how about you? Um, one thing we didn't really talk about is the sludge. Is it going to still be able to landfill, or I mean, uh, land spread? Are we going to have to landfill with different regulations coming up? Or is there even an opportunity with this granular sludge to maybe get into a malorganite process where we could create a small revenue stream possibly or offset costs? Sure, yeah, no, good question. Uh, all of the options that were evaluated would still have a class B sludge that would uh, be, be land applied. Uh, the, it, we did not include uh, costs for going to class A, which would have less strict limits. Uh, you know, for potential future regulations. Uh, I'm sure you've all heard in the news, uh, PFAS being a concern with biosolids. Uh, at, at this point, uh, it's, it's early to say, but what we're hearing is that uh, the DNR is not expecting that to have a significant economic impact on the state. So we have not included anything like you know, incineration of sludge or anything like that in, in, in these costs, even looking out 40 years. But if those regulations were to occur, uh, those costs would be in addition to what we have here. But um, basically the, the, the difference in sludge management from uh, the existing plant versus the option three new treatment plant option is that we've included dewatering so just uh, you know greatly reducing the volume of sludge and and, pro and producing a, a drier sludge cake rather than a liquid that would be applied but it but it would all still be land applied you going with like a screen press system then or is it be a screw press or uh centrifuge centrifuge yep So, um, yeah, you had mentioned malorganite. Um, if you do go to a class A product, if you were to dry your sludge and, and go to class A, then you could, uh, you know, you could potentially sell that to landscapers and things and things like that. But, but generally we've seen that just on a purely economic basis that, uh, that doesn't pan out. Um, where where dryers are being installed it's where there's difficulty getting the sludge out onto the land and you need to take advantage of the both the large reduction in volume from drying it and and then having it be a, a higher class product so if you were to dry it yes you, you could theoretically have a product that you could sell um, but we just haven't seen those economic work economics work in most cases Any more questions, Steve? Nope, that should do it for me, thank you. How about you, Mark? Any more questions, follow-up questions? No, no, thank you. Um, I do have something. I sent Paul this email, and I'm pretty sure that what I'm about to say might be have a social stigma, but what about discharging into the water system rather than trying to find a remote river? It's it's been it's done out obviously out west in drought stricken oh, cities, and there were a couple of Milwaukee suburbs that were having radon issues with their wells. That were also considering just pumping the effluent back into the water system. Are there different rules for that kind of discharge? Yeah, so that so that would be a, a much higher treatment than what would be required for the surface water discharges than. Oh. As, as what we've uh, assumed here. So the, the cost for that would be, would be much higher. Much higher? Uh, yeah, we, and, and you know, there's options for groundwater discharges too as well, but uh, those, those comes, come with their own drawbacks as well for uh, higher limits and uh, pumping costs and all that. So uh, the, the options that we've looked at here uh, the, our, the surface water discharges to either Rock Creek or Crawfish River, and uh, I believe those are going to be the lowest cost options available. Um, so we also have a, uh, a yard waste facility near the current site that we're going to move. If 
can we free up that space for expanding on the current site? So I'm not familiar with where that yard waste site yeah. is. Perhaps Stephen Paul can elaborate on that or answer my question. Yeah, it's just a little bit north of the existing plant. Uh, let's see on that photo, if you see the white building, it's kind of directly across from that. Just, I guess, just east of the the uh, boundary line, the blue line you see, go to your, yeah, yeah if you would, Steve. You're close. You're close. It's not a very large site. Oh, oh, down there. Okay. And how large is that? I, I think if you look at the plans. I think if you look at the plans uh, on option one. On option one. Um, if you look immediately east of what he's got listed as modified storage building, there is a little bit of real estate there just to the east of what the, where the effluent discharge is. I don't know if it's usable. Okay, that's why I was asking. So it doesn't matter. Yep, that area right there, Travis. Yep. Yeah, it's that a fairly area. narrow narrow strip of land, and then it's wetlands right behind it. Yeah, the road the road floats. Yeah, the road, I know that. So in the winter time, it's up. So in the summer time, it goes down. <laughs> Okay, yeah, we can we can consider that uh, as well. I mean, that just with the proximity to the creek, that that may be difficult, but um, yeah, that's it's definitely worth uh, adding into the consideration, though. Because at this point, I'm leaning towards option two. I know there's going to be arguments against that, but. I don't know what how the what the other board members are feeling right now. Well, uh, option one, it, option two could be considered a down the road variation of option one as well. Yeah. Yes, that's that's correct. Um, op, option one uh, could be implemented with, you know, basically uh, planning to pump took the crawfish river in the future uh, when the effluent limits become more strict. And then at that time, you would pull the trigger on uh, constructing the force main to avoid uh, a costly upgrade if the limits get more strict. So as, a, so as a relatively new board member, let me ask, we would, I mean, ultimately at some point we're, I mean, are we making a recommendation today? Are we going to vote on a recommendation uh, on what we would send over to the city council or how does this work? Yeah, it's, I mean, this is big. I mean, I'm, I was expecting debate and to come away from tonight's meeting just thinking about stuff. So, so Paul and Steve, do, do you need a recommendation tonight, or can we table making a recommendation? Well, the ideal situation or scenario would be if you were ready to make a recommendation on a specific plan, mm -hmm. that would be terrific. But, you know, I'm, uh, can we do that? I, next I time? understand that that probably isn't exactly what's going to happen. Well, here's my, here's my thought. If I, you know, mm -hmm. you've kind of mentioned a variation to one of them, I guess what I would encourage, if you will, is maybe narrowing it down. And we say to, uh, to Strand, let's really look at this option or these two options a little more in depth and then uh, study those a bit more and make a recommendation. 
I just I want to go back to my other comment that you know we we need to keep moving moving forward. So I, I'm kind of looking at you know Rick Travis and Scott Jane. Is that a world situation if we have them narrow it down and we come back next month and see if we can get a recommendation then? Does that put us behind the eight ball? Are there things we can still do to keep moving? No, no, I, I, I'm, I'm just curious um, for the board, uh, what, are, what are your thoughts on the kind of the non-economic side of this? Because, uh, you know, as engineers, we can really dive into to the dollar amounts and, and phasing and different technologies and all, all of that. What, what we can't really recommend is how you feel about the the non-monetary side of the question so I, I don't know if there's if there's anything further the board wants to say about uh kind of the pros and cons of the options and, and how you're feeling about staying where you're at or, or going to a, a, a new site yeah i i am i just see a lot of people opposing the new site people who live along the river and you know, lobbying the county board to stop, you know, the city of Lake Mills. And I'm, I'm not quite sure that the, the properties around the existing site can't be bought. I mean, sooner or later, you know, those people just probably want to sell the building. I don't know. I don't know who owns it, or I, I can't speak for them, but. It seems like the trailer park could be easily moved elsewhere. I mean, if, if you make the right offer to the uh, trailer park, I hear laughter, so maybe I'm wrong about that. So, yeah, the federal restrictions on moving people is incredible. So even though the you could buy the real estate, getting the people out of the trailers could take yeah. a long time. Yeah, you got to find them a new spot, right? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. I, I, I live in Madison. I, I know a lot, a lot of apartments were torn down and the city had to find new housing for the people who live there. So, okay. You just confirmed what I, so. Well, well, to the question before though, I mean, I think that the, it, it's the biggest issue here cost. I know that in our previous board meeting, we, we talked about the cost of, um, um, you know, water and sewer and, and things like that and a potential um, view into it. I mean, is that, I mean, I know we talked about is there are non-economic um, or mon non-monetary um, questions. I, I think that it is primarily monetary. I mean, correct me if I'm wrong, other board members. Well, yeah, I mean, option three is more expensive. <clears throat> so the question is, do we want to go for the more expensive option just to be more comfortable having a bigger site? I think option three not only gives you a better, bigger site, but it gives you more options down the road. Right. Rules and regulations are going to change. You know, it's impossible to predict. So you want to give yourself as many options to make compliance easy and cost effective. I think option two has potential. My opinion, option one is not a good start. And you're just going to get yourself in a bigger pickle. So for me, it would be between option two and option three. I'd like to understand option two a little bit more to make sure that we didn't get ourselves kind of in a worse hole by spending a bunch more money and then having rules or regulations change on us. And now we're stuck with this big investment and we're really, and we've really kept encapsulated ourselves downtown. Yeah, the, so the downside of option two is that if you put all the significant investment up front in a pump station and force main, and then you grow faster than expected, and you realize 20 years from now that you do need to move to a different plant, um, then yeah, that, that's even more infrastructure. So some of this comes down to the crystal ball as far as population projections. 
because uh, as I mentioned, under that DOA projection, the 1% per year, the differential between option one and option three is, is, is higher. As you look all farther and as, as growth increases to those higher rate projections, then that gap narrows. So it, it, it kind of comes down to thoughts on growth as well. Question. For an option two, across the street from the treatment plant, we have the city garage where they do a lot of our truck maintenance stuff there. What if we use that property and just move the garage? That garage would be easier to move. You'd pick up several acres there right across the street. That's a large chunk of land. I mean, there's cost to moving the garage, but it's basically a pre-engineered building. It's not a huge expense like it would be like a city hall or something. I think we had that evaluated at one time and it, it didn't work well. But uh, yeah, we can look at that again. I'm just looking at the map. That's almost as, that's probably 50% of the land space that we have right now for the treatment plant. You know, stepping back a little bit, I may be way behind the rest of the group, but I, I'm still a little awestruck that the, uh, the DNR would impose a new regulation on the city and then kind of hang us out to dry for 30 to 50 million of infrastructure in order to meet it uh, without any sort of aid or whatever and have it completely put on the shoulders of the rate payers where the rate is, it looks like you know, could double or beyond that. Um, and I, I'm very uncomfortable with, with making any, or, you know, being asked to make any sort of decision tonight, having just been, you know, been watching this for about 35 or 40 minutes. We, we've just uh, scratched the surface here. So, so, so all, all of these costs are more than just the DNR phosphorus and other limits. These costs are also for for growth. And yes, that that's correct. Um, the, the, this also basically it includes plant wide upgrades to accommodate equipment that uh, is beyond its useful life. It's thirty years old and worn out, and uh, it also accommodates that increase in peak flows that that uh, we're seeing. Uh, there's been more and more peak wet weather events, flooding throughout the state. We've seen peak flows, uh, you know, not this year, but, uh, but in other years uh, become much higher. So, so this also accommodates uh, being able to pass all that flow through the plant. Uh, that, that's certainly a large part of this as well. So, um, you know, certainly phosphorus is a key issue here, but, uh, but, but there are also a, a lot of areas at the plant that, that need to be addressed in addition to phosphorus, just, just due to age, uh, because the last major upgrade was uh, early 90s. So okay. a, a, a big advantage of continuing to work at the current site is all these improvements don't have to be done at once. If you build a new, if you go to a new site, there is a big, big upfront capital cost if we remain at the current site, all these costs do not have to occur in the next five years. Yeah, yes, uh, options one and two could be phased. Uh, again, depending on growth, maybe you could do a project now and a, and a project, you know, maybe even 10 years from now. Um, so, so yes, you, you're correct. But then you also have the issue of potential bunch of sunk costs. We talked about that, right? Like depending on what the growth is, there there's only so much room for ex expansion on the current site. And it doesn't seem like we have a whole lot of options, whether that be the yardway site or um, you know the the garage that's nearby. Like expansion is very limited, from what it seems like. I mean, growth of Dane County, particularly expansion around Sun Prairie, east side of Madison, just seems like Lake Mills. I mean, just look at real estate now in Lake Mills, I mean, it's a desirable place to live. Uh, and I would think that that would just increase um, as time goes on, particularly in that 20 to 40 year time horizon. 
con consider that the how technology will change in 40 years. This is planned out at a high growth rate at the current site for 40 years. How, how can you predict what's available for technology or regulations 40 years from now? Yeah, that's that's a great point. Uh, yeah, e even even 20 years from now is is difficult. If I were going to no, if I were going to throw in my two cents, in my two cents, I would worry less about uh, the growth than I would about the regulations, because Rock Creek is going to be the biggest stumbling block we have. Um, I don't think we're going to outpace one percent over the next twenty years. So if we were if we were looking at it basically on growth, um, I would say that we option one would be the plan, but. If you're going to look at regulations in the long term, along with growth, then you're going to then you're going to have to start weighing and balancing a little bit better. You're going to have to polish up your crystal ball. I would agree. Yeah, with that. I agree it would be very with that. If uh, Lake Mills had the same growth rate as some of the uh, Madison, the Madison suburbs that were uh, mentioned earlier. I'm sorry, I missed the first part of your question. I had the speaker down. I, I, uh, I tend, this is John, I tend to agree with Steve on the um, anticipated growth rate. Uh, you know, it was you, the, the larger growth rates uh, were based on, <clears throat> here in the projection, the larger growth rates of what, two, two and a half percent were, uh, were based on uh, comparisons with, uh, with, um, with suburban and bedroom communities very close into Madison where the rate is really, really growing. I, I don't see Lake Mills as, and, and based on the last few years of growth, I don't see that being a big problem. I, I would worry more about the regulations than the growth rate, like Steve said. So, so the current site can discharge to the Crawfish River, which certainly helps with regulations. So yeah, that would be option two. Uh, that that would require the pump station in Force Main. But but yes, the, uh, yeah, you could upgrade the existing site and, and pump to Crawfish. Just to be clear, that, that changes some of the requirements, but not all. Yes, let, let me just flip back to the limits here. So, so mainly what that does is that eliminates that low level phosphorus limit and you'd be able to stay with the current limit uh, of, of one milligram per liter. Yeah. Oh, yes. Yes. Yep. Very, yep. Very good point. So, and then in the future, if if Rock Creek gets reclassified, you avoid even more stringent limits. Do Do you know why the DNR differentiates between option two and option three for some of the limits, even though the discharge point is the same? Um, Jane, can you? Clarify that which, why? So that I think it's mainly BOD, the anti backsliding. Yeah, yeah. So they're anti backsliding, uh, preventing you from going from a less um, going to a less stringent limit on your uh, on, for the same treatment plant. Uh, that's that's primarily the the difference there. But the phosphorus limit hasn't taken hasn't gone into effect yet, so that's why it's different for phosphorus. So, so if the DNR tightened, for example, BOD, and we were on option two, they wouldn't tighten, they wouldn't necessarily tighten that 10 to 14, they would be tightening from a 30 to something tighter, correct? So for option two, uh, if, 
I, I'm sorry, maybe I, I'm misunderstanding your question. Can can you ask that again? So, for, as an example, BOD is, has a tighter requirement for option two than it does for option three, and you explained that that was because of backsliding. They're not going to re relax the requirements for an existing plant. So, presumably, the DNR is going to be continue to tighten uh, requirements rather than loosen them. So if they would, for example, tighten the BOD limit, they wouldn't, would, they, would they base any tightening of that limit most likely on option, uh, on the limits for option three, the requirements for the Crawfish River, or would they look at the anti-backsliding requirements that we have, would have? So if, if, if you stay at this existing site, you'll, you'll never have, the, the limits will never get easier um, at, you know, for, for the limits that are in place, even if you pump over to, to the Crawfish River. Uh, so <clears throat> the, the limits that would most likely get more stringent would be nitrogen-based, ammonia-based in the future. So, it, so it's possible that that um, these limits on Rock Creek will get get even more stringent, um, it, and and the, and you'd be stuck with those limits unless you move to a brand new site on the crawfish. Yeah, it, you would get a brand new permit if you went to a new new site. If if the DNR tightened nitrogen limits on the Crawfish River, and let's take the bottom, the DLA max at 11, if they cut that in half, would they cut the the anti backslid number in half, or would they, you know, would it go from 11 to 5.5 on the Crawfish? Would it go to from 6.2 to 5.5, or would it go from 6.2 to 3.1? So are you asking if they change the limits on the crawfish? Um, so, 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 uh, so you're asking yeah. under, under option two. Can I walk up to the board and try and make a little example? I think I understand what he's saying. Right. No, no. The two are still considered Rock Creek. One and two are still considered Rock Creek. Um, only three is considered the crawfish. So if it's more likely, it's, yeah, it's still, because it's on the backslid line, it's probably going to be considered a Rock Creek. So if they drop this limit, or BODs, it's probably going to hit here, and that's going to get tighter than two. I, what, what happens is, why well, I don't even know why we're looking at the crawfish because the likelihood that that Rock Creek is going to get tightened down is much more significant than than the crawfish because there's a lot more water flow at the crawfish. I understand, but that's what his question was. If yeah, the crawfish, if it gets tighter on the crawfish, is it going to hit us here? If it gets tighter on option three, is it going to affect option two also? If the limits are yeah, I think, thanks. I think I see what you mean now. Yeah. 
So for BOD, it's a little different because it's flow based. Um, but if it was something that was a toxic compound like ammonia, if the criteria got more stringent on the crawfish, then yes, it would it would get more stringent for either option two or option three. Um, but with option three, you've got a little more breathing room. Like, um, trying to think how to describe it. So just looking at ammonia, you know, if it was cut in half for option three, say from 11 down to 5.5, .5, I think you'd find that for option two, it would just go from 6.2 to 5.5, .5, all other things being equal. Does that answer your question? Yes, that, that was exactly my question and thank you for the answer. Okay, yeah. In general, with option three, there's more breathing room for all the limits, really. Why would that matter? I mean, you're still pumping it in the Crawfish River from the existing site or a new site. So why would they have different limits on where the source site is at? If for the limits that are shown here, it's because it would be a brand new site, a brand new treatment plant. So you get a brand new permit with option three. So they're, they're getting with... The, the DNR thinks that our current site can do this. So our current plant can do it. So it should continue to do it. Right, with option two, yeah. So there, there'd be no backsliding for your existing wastewater treatment plant because it's an existing facility. They know that you can remove this much ammonia so they won't let your ammonia limits go from 6.2 to 11, for example. But, 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 it, but, but those lower limits for option two are not a, a long-term uh, detriment as the DNR tightens the requirements. Or not a long-term, can you repeat that one? Sorry. But, any any changes to requirements will be based upon the the, the, the anti backsliding limits won't be a consideration in the DNR's newer limits. Instead, the new any newer limits would be based upon the Crawfish River rather than the anti backsliding limits. Yes, yes, that's correct. Like the fact that the phosphorus limit hasn't gone into effect yet, the stringent one hasn't gone into effect in the permit yet. That's why you're able to get a more relaxed limit for option two to the crawfish. So if I understand your question right, if, for example, if um, they set new limits for chlorides, let's say, they would be much less restrictive if you went to the crawfish than they would be on Rock Creek because crawfish has a lot more dilution so regardless of option two or option three, if you had new chloride limits, they would be less stringent for the crawfish than they would for Rock Creek. Um, sure, <laughs> Scott asked if I could explain how permit limits are set. It, it's kind of complicated. I mean, it varies whether it's BOD and TSS compared to a toxic compound like ammonia, nitrogen, or chlorides. So if it's ammonia, chlorides, or other toxic compounds, then they, and phosphorus, even though it's not toxic, um, they base it on the amount of dilution or some of capacity in the receiving stream. So if you have a very small stream with little dilution, or if you have a stream that has a high concentration of that particular pollutant upstream of the outfall, then you're not given a lot of dilution and your limits tend to be more, tend to be more stringent. Um, so something like, you know, using chloride again as an example, um, in the Crawfish River, the concentrations of chloride are very likely below water quality standards and there's a lot of dilution in the crawfish. So you would have a very relaxed limit compared to Rock Creek, which has very little dilution. Um, and Scott just gave me a thumbs up, so I hope I hope that makes sense to everyone.
temperature is another example. We, we showed the November limit for temperature for Rock Creek, but that hasn't gone into effect yet. So you would not have a temperature limit at all for the Crawfish River. And if you stay with option one, we would try to get you a variance on that temperature limit. But anyway, that, that's just another example of why um, going discharging to a larger river is usually usually results in less stringent limits. So ultimately, it's the Crawfish River. Right. I, I think I think that's that's a, a good long term strategy, even if it's not done now, because uh, again, the Rock Creek could be reclassified in the future, uh, which would result in even more strict limits than than what we have shown here. Correct. Anybody on the board disagree with that? So is that enough direction? Obviously, Crawfish River is the ultimate goal. Yeah, yes, but in general, I prefer to keep my money in the pot in my pocket until I have to spend it. Sure. Mo yeah. mo it's, it's it's more money is more versatile than having a, having stuff built into the ground. Mm -hmm. So, marks in favor of option one with Rock Creek until DNR says no more Rock Creek and then he switched to Crawfish River. Is that correct, Mark? Yes, it's basically a, a, a phased approach. Mm -hmm. spend, yeah. spend, spend, do, do the upgrades when we need to do the upgrades. Yeah, I agree with that too. Yeah, so so the the only concern with that strategy is with um, if, if that phosphorus limit of that 0.075 goes into effect, then you're stuck with it even if you do go to the go to the crawfish. On MDD. option two. On option two. Yeah, yeah on option two. Um, so the MDV would delay that process if it's granted. So do you feel like you got to have direction for the next meeting? I mean, unless we have a special vote. The way the DNR sets this up so you don't backslide, it's almost an encouragement to build a new plant, to get a new permit. Otherwise, you're stuck with that anti-backslide so you get the lower limits all the time no matter where you go. Uh, it, it, in this specific situation with the, the big difference between Rock Creek and the Crawfish River, uh, th that, is, that is the case. And it, so, the, the, I, I mean, if, if, if the option to effluent pumping can be done before any changes are made to the discharge limits. That's a reasonable way to go, right? Is if it's a reasonable expectation that we, that, that can be done. Yeah, so so going you're saying going with a phased approach, basically option one uh, up until the point where uh, you know, you can still avoid getting stricter limits, then at that point you'd, you'd shift to option two. That's what you're saying. Yes, correct. <clears throat> My 
My challenge is the crystal ball again. When's that limit going to change? Because we need some time to put it in, pro in place to get this to the crawfish before that actually changes and we get hit with it. So we should know that maybe November? That's next that month. We could push DNR. I mean, if they say it's going to happen within two years, we got to just about start now with the whole process and permitting and executing because you're not going to get that done going to the crawfish in less than a year. That's going to be a two-year process to get it all permitted and get it there easily. Yeah, it would be the, yeah, I would, yeah, this October 31st, 2025 date, that's when that 075 limit goes into effect on Rock Creek. So that's, that's the clock that you're trying to beat. Unless you get the MDD, which we will hopefully know in no November or December. So we got three and a half years basically sitting right here to get it done. Or, or if we get the MDV, then we have 15 years. But you're paying for a discharge too. Then you got to pay that $25 a pound or $50 a pound. I bet yeah, that's they're... way cheaper. But that... Uh... But that doesn't uh, deal with the other plant limitations of the aging equipment and peak flow capacity. Right, we're going to start throwing money at high, high dollars at maintenance because we're going to have something that's going to be 45 years old instead of 30 years old. Exactly. Well, well the other option is to spend even higher dollars building a new plant. You want to spend lower dollars maintaining this plant or higher dollars building a new plant that will be uh, 40 years old 40 years from now. Just because it's cheaper now doesn't mean it's a better option long term. Well, I mean, I, for me, for, for, for me, the, the option one makes no sense whatsoever. Um, based off of everything that's been presented. I mean, I'd be willing to make a vote to just determine if we should throw that out altogether and consider option two or option three and determine if we're gonna need some more information to make an assessment based off of that. I'd support that. I guess that's an official motion, Misty. I, it, it cut out, I couldn't oh. do anything for like the last 30 seconds until you just said that was an official motion. Yeah, okay, so Bennett proposed throwing out option one and going with option two and option three, correct? So, so if, I, if I can just clarify here, this, this is Travis. Um, w when you say option two, are you saying, uh, immediately construct the force main and pumping station now or are you saying uh, construct when you need to to avoid having less or having more strict limits it's bennett's motions though can you answer his question bennett yeah yeah i'd be fine to say that um the option would be that we either move for i mean it seems pretty clear that the future is going to be crawfish. It just depends when. So yes, the, it would be really moving forward with um, with uh, the crawfish option, and um, you know, laying the pipeline and the permitting process, like Steve alluded to earlier. Just doing it right away. That, that's what you're saying. I, I just want to make sure I'm understanding what you're asking for. I mean, here's my thing with this. I mean, I think that right, we're probably not going to be able to make a decision tonight on the exact option, but we can start narrowing and figuring out how to best move forward with this, right? Right now we have three. We haven't really made a whole bunch of headway on what we're going to, how we're going to move this process along. So I think that there, we need to start narrowing down and determining where we're going to go to. Spring hey, Bennett. And this is Dan Drescher. Um, I'm wondering if your yep. uh, your motion is just basically to remove option one from consideration. That doesn't necessarily 
set up a timetable for uh, considering and enacting option two or option three. But if you're done with option one and the board feels the same way, I think that's something that you can vote on at this, at this time. Yes, thank you, Dan. Thank you for the clarification. Yes. You're very welcome. Is there a second? I'll second. So we, we got a motion to just totally throw out option one. And I pretty much agree. I mean, eventually it's going to be the Crawfish River. It's just a matter of time. So we might as well start planning that now. Any other comments on the motion? Or discussion? <clears throat> okay, Misty, you can call the roll call vote on that motion then. Can I verify who made the second? Was it Mr. Fields? Oh, uh, yeah, it was. Thank you. Mr. Temperley? Aye. Mr. Fields? Aye. Mr. Reich? Aye. Mr. Rupplinger? Aye. Mr. Picard? Aye. Motion passed 5 0. So I think that's. No. Yeah, Paul? I'm, I'm sorry, let me jump in. Does that give you enough direction to keep moving? Do you, is there anything more? <coughs> that you need from the board tonight then are you good um so i i guess the the plan moving forward then for next week's council meeting what are what are you envisioning uh what, what are you needing from us for for the meeting a week from today i guess kind of more details i guess on how we're going to discharge does that make sense is this appropriate to go to council at this point? And should we wait for more information on the MVP? That's only November, right? Yeah. I, if we can get to the mic. From my standpoint, this is Steve, Steve Wilkie. Um, um, if we can get, we to, can get to another, another month, month to think, think about, this about this and work on, those, work two on those two options, options I, I would be I happy would be if you guys can yes, do that. Okay. And, 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 and I think we just go to the public works board again and then we hit the council up. Council up. So maybe what we can do is, um, is get that information to DNR based on what was in this tech memo and we can try to get an answer as soon as possible on the MDV. And, and circle back on the next next board meeting. Then. Would it be possible to get some more information? I mean, cost is the hang up here, right? And I know that in the cost slide, there was some indication that there were a number of factors that weren't included. So for example, population growth, even if it was the more conservative estimation of uh, population growth, the prospect of some grants, things like that to get a more realistic estimate of what this would do to to rates within Lake Mills, I think would be very helpful information. Yeah, so so we'll have to uh, take a take a look at how option one and two would be or I'm sorry, option two at this point would be phased um, it to, to narrow that down a little bit better. It's still going to be a. What are your thoughts on our boards? Oh, sorry, Steve, go ahead. It's still going to be a real shot in the dark. And that's, I mean, and that's fine. We're talking about a million different options here. And, and to fit them down into to something that's going to be, you know, long term feasible, it's, it's just going to be a couple good guesses. That's probably what you're going to get. Well, that's kind of what we're doing too. I mean, we basically got this in our packets on Wednesday or Friday and we've been studying this for, I mean, I've looked at this for the last three days and we're making some big decisions on some big dollars with three days of uh, looking at information. It'd be nice to let it settle in and maybe ask a few questions just to get a little comfort level on our end too. And that's where I think people are a little shaky right now is this is only 72 hours is hard to make a decision like this. 
Yeah, that was a similar conversation we had this morning. Was <laughs> if it were up to me, I no way I'd make that decision tonight. I think that's where everybody feels right now. We just want to let this settle in and get a few more options, just to, so we have a comfort level making that recommendation. Well, just just to chime in, I I, I I'm my 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 decision would be option two tonight. I knew a month ago, or the last time we talked about this, you know, we had talked about this before, and it was, it was clear that, the, that building a new plant would be more expensive, and this just provided more, more financial uh, details on that. So we have been looking at this for a while. Just wanted to let you know where, I, where I'm at. Well, this is Paul, and I, I'll say, actually, we, we came a long way tonight. I mean, I, I think when we started the discussion, it was, oh, my God, I don't, I don't know what's going on here, and you guys kind of worked through it, and so I appreciate that. Um, and as I mentioned, we've got to keep steady on it, so as long as we've got next steps in mind, that helps. I do understand it's a huge, huge decision, lots of dollars. Um, I just want to make sure that we don't get sideways with the DNR and that, you know, we keep on a pace that they know we're working on this. You know, I know the DNR knows me very well. I have my own parking spot there and, and they're going to stuff me and put me in the display case when all this is over. But uh, I think if we keep in contact with them and they know there's some progress that they'll work with us. And as I said, I mean, this is a lengthy process, but we've got some decisions that have to be made. Uh, doesn't mean they have to be uninformed decisions. And so uh, Travis and Jane and Scott, if you've got what you need to come to the November Public Works Board meeting with the understanding then like the last uh, city council meeting in November, we can make a stronger recommendation. Does that yes. work? Yep. We'll plan on that. Okay. And then, Todd, what I would ask you, now we've got a recommendation that will be forwarded to the council. What, what do we want them to have for information? Do we simply want to give them this presentation and the other paper that Strand presented, or do we want to present an initial or put together an initial presentation for the council, or how should we proceed in that regard? I think the Public Works Board can make this recommendation on their own. doesn't need to go to council. Then they can come back with their final recommendation at the next meeting and go to council. And if the council wants to have a broader view, they've got the, the original documents, and they can watch this meeting, and they can watch the next meeting. Okay, and you hit on what's important to me is that the council members keep keep informed about this. So I'm good with that. And you don't need uh, anyone from Strand at the October 19th council meeting, correct? Okay. That's what I was asking, and I think not. Okay. But we will come back. You know, you'll flesh out some more of the information, some of the, the costs is, to the extent you can. And, I, again, I know there's, like Steve said, there's a million variables here, but... Uh, narrow in on some assumptions, uh, and let's give this this board another chance to look at some more dollars. And I think, again, I, th I think we're coming out of here with uh, more of a recommendation than I thought we would. That you know we've narrowed it down, and I think there's a fairly good understanding of uh, the issues we're facing and what's in front of us to take care of those. So we've accomplished something here, I think. Um, we're going to invite you to be with us for Thanksgiving at the council meeting. <laughs> Great. What do you want me to bring? <laughs> uh, whatever it is, just so it doesn't have phosphorus. <laughs> okay. <laughs> All right. Thank you. So I guess that's it for agenda then number six. So number seven, recommendations for future agendas. Um, I have done because I know next month we'll be back at this again. So anybody else have something they want to bring up for a future agenda? 
Todd, I do have one. That's when we were going to talk, come bring bring back the electric utility deep dive. So we've got WPPI and our electric engineer lined up to be at that meeting too. So we'll continue that deep dive along with this. Okay. Anything else? Then I'll uh, declare the meeting adjourned. So thanks everybody and I'll talk with you next month.